I'm on video, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Hey, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. We are starting live with uh, our new webinar, Creating Code Samples for API uh, SDK Documentation, hosted by the famous and wonderful Tom Johnson. Um, this webinar is brought to you thanks to SOAP. Uh, be sure to check out our website and look out for our conference coming this October. Uh, Tom, take it away, please. All right, I'm just going to share my uh, screen here. And let me know, uh, one second. Uh, okay. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, you are golden. Okay. All right, uh, first of all, uh, before we jump in here, Paul, can you give me a better uh, idea of who kind of is listening? Are, are most of the people here uh, people in Poland who are trying to get into API SDK documentation, or are there a lot of people who maybe have uh, experience doing this kind of documentation? I just want to better understand my audience. Sure. Frankly, we don't know that. Uh, most of the audience are seem to be coming from your uh, web traffic. They are not so uh, people that we know and that we have surveyed. Okay. And uh, the other question. Um, <clears throat> actually, it's escaped me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can, can people ask questions live, or do I just save those for the end, or what? People, yeah, people can uh, ask questions using the tool, but I would save them for the end, and we can go down the list and, and, and read them one by one. Okay, okay. Yeah, well, feel free to just stop me at any time and uh, uh, raise a question that maybe surfaces in chat or some other other way. Sure, right. and for the, for the audience, um, there's a Q&A tool if you're on the event page. Um, you just click Q&A, and you can ask your questions there. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I've actually, uh, yeah, my whole screen is taken up by my PowerPoint, so I don't actually see that, but I'll, I'll try to check it periodically, or, or you can just interrupt me. All right, let's uh, get started. I'll let you, okay. I'll let you know. You, you just go okay. ahead with your presentation. Okay, okay. Well, I'm excited to give this presentation because um, I've never given this pr a presentation on this topic before, and this is something I'm really somewhat passionate about. Uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, or 14 months or so, I moved out to the Bay Area, the, the Silicon Valley area uh, in California, and there are a lot of tech companies out here. Uh, it's a place I've been wanting to move for a long time. And more than any other type of uh, job, I think, around here are jobs for technical writers that involve working with APIs and other developer documentation. Um, there, are, there are a ton of startups, and a lot of them are um, SaaS models that deliver some kind of API that people hook into for, for, uh, in order to get whatever kind of information or code it is that they need. And there's a strong need for uh, people who can write for developers. Um, I was just at a, a session the other night, uh, an STC meeting, talking about trends and, and the workplace here. And there was a kind of overriding uh, uh, discussion about how that opportunities for end user documenters, people who write for just regular end users, is kind of diminishing while uh, opportunities to write for developers is flourishing. There are more opportunities than ever. So when, when you get into this realm of documenting for developers, you run into a major challenge, and that is code samples. How do you write them? Um, and so I'm going to get into this. And now the format I'm, I'm choosing here is to answer about 20 questions surrounding code samples. It didn't seem like there was a clear narrative from beginning to end about, about this topic that I, I really saw. Um, so I just decided to list a bunch of questions. Um, a little bit about me first. Uh, I mentioned that I've been doing this uh, for a little more than a year. Uh, so I don't have a ton of experience in this. Uh, that said, I'm pretty passionate about it, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to surface a lot of the questions that maybe you have. Um, and as I said, this is the first time I've presented on this topic, 
Also, I should just note, I, I don't have a programming background. I'm not a, I, I wasn't a developer for 20 years, as a lot of people in this field are who do this kind of documentation. Uh, I was an English major. I had a master's in, in nonfiction creative writing. Uh, and I kind of wandered around and, and landed in this after uh, eight or so years as a regular technical writer. All right, so let's jump in here. What are code samples? Of course, we want to know what we're talking about. Uh, now, these are usually supplementary material that, that accompanies an API or SDK reference documentation. Um, API stands for Application Programming Interface, SDK, Software Development Kit. These are basically uh, ways that people hook into uh, some kind of service and get information. So these code samples can be short. They can be long. They can be full of comments. They can have a bunch of explanation that goes line by line. They might not have any explanation at all. And let's give a few examples here. Uh, the first one I'm going to go through is on jQuery's documentation. Um, here's just a sample screenshot. And you see this on pretty much every method listed in, in the jQuery API. But uh, as, the, as the author here is explaining uh, this, this um, method, which is the each method. Uh, th I'm there's... sorry to interrupt. Um, sure. We're not seeing we're not seeing the slideshow. We're seeing your um, uh, your uh, PowerPoint or whatever it is open, but we're we're not seeing this the slide that you're talking about. Uh, okay. Well, what slide do you see? Well, we just see the um, like the like the gen like like your application uh, with the slide list on the left, the notes at the bottom, and one slide in the middle. We're not seeing the full screen presentation view. Hmm. All right. Let me let me try that again. You, so you don't see anything now? No, still just the application. Uh, let's see here. Let me see if I can just share my desktop um, with the Google thing instead of trying to share a specific, uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, any better? This is perfect. Okay. Yeah, I, was, I tried to share just a specific application rather than the whole screen. So anyway, this is, a, this is a screenshot from jQuery's API documentation. And uh, uh, I guess if you hadn't seen the slides, let me just go back. Uh, this is the first question we're tackling. What are code samples? And I'm just giving a few examples of code samples just so we're grounded in what we're talking about. So here the, the author kind of is describing one of the methods in the jQuery API, which is the each method. It iterates over a list of things, and the person uh, is showing how this works through some code samples that are peppered in here. Now these are, are somewhat short. They illustrate exactly what, uh, what this method does. And then as you scroll down more into the examples section, they get lengthier and more, more robust. This documentation is actually really cool because, um, because it's essentially JavaScript, you can run things in the browser and show show them in action. So it's dynamic. Here's a sample code uh, code from a, a Oracle Java uh, documentation set. Here this is talking about classes and it gives an example of a class. So you have an introductory paragraph that just talks in general about what are classes and hey, here's an example. Um, one more, this is from uh, a book I was just reading on uh, Java in Safari Flow. This is by Kathy Sierra and somebody else. And they're talking about um, how to pa pass arguments to a method and so forth. And so there's some, some samples. So basically, the code samples are intermixed with explanatory material. And they illustrate some kind of technique, principle, some point. Uh, but it gets you into the realm of code, which is usually uh, it, it's a it's a step in a different field than most of us are used to. You know, unless you've been a programmer, in which case it's probably second nature. But for most of us with non-programming backgrounds, whenever we have to dive into code, it really presents a lot of challenges. All right, number two, why why add code samples? Well, first of all, code samples. They're in 
another language, right? Programming code is not English. It's in another language. And if an audience speaks this other language, the code actually communicates a lot more clearly to them. Uh, they can read and understand it without uh, trying to understand maybe a narrative description. If you, if you try to describe what a class is or method is, a lot of times the terms don't exactly um, communicate in the same immediate and clear way that an actual code sample does. Programmers, they often just skip right to the examples to see how something is done. And finally, the, the examples really illustrate what your product does in a clear and immediate way. So there's a lot of reason to add code samples, and uh, I'm going to get into some of the difficulties more and the complexities a bit later. So which language should the code samples be in? Uh, this is a quote from uh, Peter Grunbaum from LinkedIn. There's a great thread, and by the way, there's a great uh, group on LinkedIn uh, that in that discusses API documentation. I think that's the name of the the group. And there was a there was an excellent discussion about uh, you know what kind of programming background people need and so forth to write these. And this question came up: What language should the code be in? And he says, I would say at least half of web APIs do not have sample code available because once you provide it in one language, developers will want sample code in Java, C Sharp, Ruby, Python, Objective C, PHP, which is often not practical to provide. The beauty of web APIs is that they can be called from almost any language. This is also a huge problem when it comes to sample code. Instead of sample code, web API documentation often just shows sample requests and responses. So this is kind of a question that uh, we need to ask from the start. Do we even need to, to provide code samples? So it depends on exactly what you're documenting. Now, if you have a web API that, for example, a REST API, a lot of those work uh, through HTTP requests. You have a URL with a certain path, and it returns certain information. And you can add, you can add parameters and options and so forth at the end of that path to return different kinds of information. But essentially, what you're doing is just supplying a URL of some kind, and you get a certain type of information back. And different uh, different languages have a way of passing a URL and getting information back. And developers skilled in those languages will be able to uh, make the API, lang API work for those languages. However, a lot of times it's not ideal to just be passing a URL and getting information like that. You want, you, you want to use, use the actual language that your program is in in order to better get the information. Um, and a lot of times, like with an SDK, uh, they're actually, you know, they're, they're in a specific language. For example, I work at Badgeville, which is a gamification startup in Redwood City. And we have a REST API, which is, is like this guy's explaining. Um, it, it's just basically uh, a way to get information back. You pass it different URLs, and it, it returns information in a JSON format. Um, <clears throat> but we also have a JavaScript SDK. So when you're, when you're coding on a web page, you use the JavaScript SDK, which has you format uh, the calls in a certain way in, it, in using JavaScript, and you can leverage all of, all of the techniques in JavaScript to iterate through the responses, to uh, do all kinds of things, to visualize them more easily. And so the code samples that I've been writing a lot have been for the SDK, not necessarily the REST API. The REST API usually has sample um, uh, some, some basic curl commands that that how you tell you how to like post, delete, you know, that kind of basic thing. But then the SDK has a lot more uh, detailed samples in a specific language. And a lot of different um, SDKs and other developer documentation will be more language specific. Now here's the big question. Do I need to be a programmer to write code samples? So this is from uh, Sarah Schertz, same LinkedIn thread here. She says, a writer must know enough programming to both read and understand code samples and create their own code samples for the documentation. As others have mentioned, this doesn't require being a full-fledged programmer, but you need some solid programming knowledge. It's just like any other documentation project in my mind. When I document software products, I use the products as an end user would to ensure that I understand what they need to know. For an API, if I'm writing the doc myself as opposed to editing docs someone else wrote, I want to use 
the API as a developer would for the same reason. So this is a this is a, a tricky question uh, because you know if you have to be a programmer to write code samples, and that excludes a lot of technical writers from the start, uh, and and for a lot of reasons, you know, being a programmer can be somewhat of a disadvantage uh, in this field. If it, usually programmers uh, by nature, uh, at least the ones I've met. Writing isn't their favorite thing. They maybe overestimate the knowledge that their audience has. Um, whereas somebody who's maybe had to learn programming as a second skill, um, they're going to see it more in, with more uh, clarity. They're going to see all these assumptions that maybe the programmer overlooks. Uh, at any rate, you, you do have to know enough programming in order to read and understand code, as she says. Um, obviously, you can't talk intelligently about a subject if you if you don't have the, the basic vocabulary, uh, what are methods, what are classes, if you can't uh, kind of look through code and see what's happening, um, really it really is kind of necessary if you want to excel in this field to know the different languages. Now here's a related question that I always hear uh, whenever this topic comes up. If I could write code, wouldn't I just be a developer? Uh, and here, Sarah Maddox has a great response. This is in an article she has uh, that will be published in Intercom soon. She says, we don't need to be code ninjas. The code in an illustrative sample is not the same thing as the production-ready code in an application. A code sample is a piece of syntactically correct and semantically useful code written to illustrate the functionality and usage of an API or a developer tool. The code sample provides a stepping stone between the conceptual overviews in the developer's guide and the complex implementation required for a production-ready application. So knowing something about programming and knowing enough about a specific language uh, is one thing. Being able to create a production-ready application using that language is something totally different. It's kind of like if somebody said, well, I can write a sentence, and you said, well, why don't you write an encyclopedia, or why don't you write a novel, right? Being able to write an email, much different, much easier than being able to write uh, some masterful work. And that's the difference between uh, knowing knowing code versus being able to really write it. And I think as a technical writer, you, you just need to be able to know code and write very simple examples of that code. Um, the, the developers who are actually creating applications create much more sophisticated, complex, uh, convoluted code, right? And and that's not necessarily what you need to be able to do in order to write code samples. So, six, how do you know what's obvious without a development background? Uh, so this photo here is supposedly of um, engineers in training. And this is a great question because if you don't know um, what uh, what is what is going to be apparent and obvious to a developer, then you're really going to be at a disadvantage. And this is one of the most difficult parts, I think. Um, I mentioned at the beginning a, a method uh, call, from jQuery's API, API called each. Now, if you're writing a code sample for an audience that mostly consists of people who know JavaScript, uh, do you assume that the person also knows jQuery, and if so, that they're familiar with the each method? Uh, you kind of have to know enough about the field to make that assumption. And uh, your, your engineers will probably tell you, oh yeah, the, the, the user would probably know this, or yeah, the user doesn't need explanation about this. Um, but this question comes, comes up a lot. There was, um, in, in one of my code samples, I actually got this from a, uh, the developer. He used the map method instead of the each method uh, from jQuery. And I was I was not sure if I needed to explain it. I had to figure out what it did, first of all. But but then I was like, well, is my audience going to know this or not? Um, and he said, no, a, a, a JavaScript developer is going to know this method. And th this is sort of the constant question that I think you run into is, will the developer know this, or is this something I have to explain? The problem with asking engineers this question is that they almost always overestimate the uh, knowledge and, and understanding of their audience. 
uh, it seems like every engineer I've ever talked to, and I know this is a gross generalization, but they always think that uh, that the user is going to understand how to do something. And then when you when you put the application, the API in front of the user, they have a ton of questions and are and don't know how to use it nearly as well as the the original engineer thought. So um, you kind of have to play a guessing game, and it's better to err on the side of being too explicit. Uh, and I'm going to get into some, into some techniques for how to address both kind of a novice audience and a more advanced audience when you're when you're explaining code. All right, number seven. Can't I just get all code samples from engineers? So here's some engineers that are probably happily coding on a couch. Uh, um, they've got the junk food in front of them, and I guess you don't see the Red Bull and other caffeine and stuff as well. But anyway, yeah, uh, you totally can get code samples from engineers, and this is this is a great um, idea. Usually, uh, if engineers are ready to or are willing to give code samples and they've got some, it's great. It should be a starting point. Usually engineers will give you a sample uh, and it will show you a pattern of how to do something and then you can kind of extrapolate from that sample and apply it to different scenarios. Uh, and that's probably the best way. They're not going to give you a sample for every specific situation, but you know they should be able to to uh, to help out with some, some basic samples. Um, Sometimes when you get code samples from engineers, they can be more complicated than they need to be. At least uh, that's been my experience. And um, you know, you want to keep the code samples simple. They should really just illustrate a specific point. Uh, it can be really easy for for an engineer who's used to working with more robust applications and scenarios to want to try to um, use more advanced techniques and so forth than than what your uh, documentation calls for in that scenario. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, engineers usually dislike documentation, I've found, but they do like talking about code. And if you find the right engineers who, who like to uh, show you the code and explain it, they can be a gold mine for um, for getting the information you need. Uh, there's a guy at my work who's really, really good at, at this. Um, he can whip up a code sample quickly, shoot it over to me, and uh, he, he usually hopes that I'll be able to make sense of it and explain it to, to the end user. Other engineers uh, aren't so, so forthcoming, but usually when you ask them, they, they are much more willing to give you code samples than actual documentation that would explain anything. All right, so number eight. Let's say you've you've come to the conclusion that yeah, you need to beef up your programming skills in order to write code samples. And so this is the next logical question: How can I learn programming? And this is this is a great question that has no easy answer. But here's what I found works really well. We live in a time when there where there are abundant resources online. Um, Safariflow.com is probably my favorite. It's a subset of safaribooksonline.com. Uh, Safari Flow focuses more on web development, and it's uh, so if you have actually, you know, it, it's almost like the subset of Safari that's relevant to this field, and it's cheaper. Um, it, it, you know, each of these costs money, but uh, I guess most everything does. Actually, that's not entirely true. If you um, go to your library, you can look at like your list of online resources. Sometimes they'll have you have a free portal link to Safari Books Online. Uh, otherwise, that the full Safari costs like forty five dollars, forty three dollars a month. The Safari Flow costs twenty nine. Lynda.com is a video based tutorial site, and that costs twenty five dollars a month. And I don't really know the details of the others on the on the pricing and everything, but. Um, Sometimes your work will, will pay for these things, but really you need you need a library of technical material. And uh, there are so many resources online to learn learn programming. It's really a matter of dedicating time, uh, setting aside some space in your schedule to ramp up slowly on on concepts uh, related to programming. CodeSchool.com is kind of a more interactive site. It's got some really really snazzy features there. 
Uh, I've never really played with Team Treehouse, but I see their commercials all the time. And finally, Udemy is like a courseware site, so it's a little more more of a course feel. You choose a course that you want to go through. Um, so the next question as you start learning programming is probably how can I keep my brain from exploding? Uh, I, I don't know about you, but if I sit down in a technical book after about an hour, I just have got too much information and, and I really can't absorb it um, beyond that point. So what I've found works really well is this app called Focus Time, which is based on a technique called the Pomodoro Technique, which just means tomato in Italian. It's after this guy who who started uh, this method for studying by taking a kitchen timer that was in the shape of a tomato that you just twist in half and it starts ticking and he would set it for 20-25 minutes or something and he would focus on studying for that one little chunk of time and then he'd take a break, like a five minute break. And then he'd do another little chunk of time and he'd take another, another break. And I found this works really well for me when I'm trying to learn programming. I'll, I'll use this focus time app set it for 25 minutes and try to uh, read as much as I can or learn as much as I can and then I'll take a break and I'll try to do several of those every day and the more you can do obviously the faster faster you'll learn but I think really to learn programming you have to chunk it into these small bits that you can easily more easily consume if you try to take off too much if you try to bite off too much at once it's just going to be frustrating um, and, and realize that it's going to take a long time to ramp up right um, software engineers uh, go through a lot of training, they, they spend all day in code um, to try to think that you can just ramp up overnight or in a week or something and get at their same level is, is, is silly. Uh, but uh, little by little you'll be able to to learn and the great thing about being a technical writer is that you're you're often presented with relevant projects. You have some kind of code in front of you that is something you're working on, something you're documenting, and if you use that as a starting point, it can make learning a lot more relevant and immediate. Okay, are code samples hard to write? This is actually a, a Sudoku a solution puzzle screenshot, um, and a few months ago, my my daughter brought home this like Sudoku assignment. This is a um, if you don't know what Sudoku is, it's like a it's a puzzle that you solve by doing putting numbers in a specific sequence and so forth. Um, and she brought it home, and I realized um, I had never done one of these. I had no idea how to do it. But in trying to figure out how to do it, it really kind of caught in my mind, and I and I really wanted to figure it out. And so I I stayed up late just trying to solve it, and was researching online, and finally figured out what the technique is to to solving these Sudoku puzzles. And I think. Code samples are a lot like this. They're puzzles that you solve. Uh, obviously, the more sophisticated the code sample, the, the more of a, a difficult puzzle is it, it, it is to solve. But in general, um, if you're the type of person who uh, um, sees, a, sees some kind of problem and sticks with it because they, you just have this knack inside that you really want to figure out how to do it or find the solution, I think code samples can be fun to write. The harder they are, the more challenging they are. It's a lot like math problems where you have some kind of problem and you have to figure out figure out uh, how to get the answer. And that sort of mentality sometimes accesses a, a different part of my brain than, than my general writing mode. But it can be engaging. So are they hard to write? It depends. If they're the more difficult kind, yeah, but they're also fun and addictive, like like a puzzle. Okay, let's get into some more technical detail here. Um, how do I add comments in code? Because let's you've, let's say you've got a code sample, and now you want to explain it to the user. Uh, what exactly do you do? Well, the most the immediate sort of response is to add comments. If you add a couple of slashes in most languages, that allows you to add a comment. So here's a screenshot from, uh, this is the same book I've been reading on Java. Uh, and here, the person is is giving a really simple explanation about how to make an object. And uh, you've got comments that are interspersed here with two slashes. Now, the problem with this, as you can probably see, is that it makes it really hard to read the code. Uh, 
Usually comments get formatted in a light gray so that they're not as distracting, but putting comments in code makes, makes it more difficult to see exactly what's going on in the code. Here's another example uh, from the same book. Here the person has decided to use uh, almost like pencil scribbling uh, to explain the code. And I've seen other examples <clears throat> where they use um, uh, typed typeset in another topography with arrows and so forth. The problem here is that in order to, to put little callouts within code, you're going to have to make the code uh, an image, I would think. Uh, and if you make the code an image, it suddenly becomes a lot harder to work with because now if you want to change something, let's say you realize you forgot a semicolon or you have weird spacing, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be much more of a pain to update. But this allows you to, to really, uh, I don't know, explain different parts of it without making it difficult to read the code itself. It's very easy here to focus just on the code and then switch over to the pencil notes in order to understand what's going on. All right, let me give you one more example. All right, here. This is actually from the WordPress file that you download, <clears throat> the WPP config, and it's got a ton of notes in this file. And here, um, because the, the writer has longer notes, they've used a, a slash with uh, asterisks. Um, that allow you to span different lines, and this is because the user just had, or the the writer, the author, what developer, had a lot of comments to add. Um, so some people really are against adding too many code comments. In, in general, I think a best practice is maybe every five or ten lines, you add a brief line of code explaining what's going on. Um, and there's a lot of kind of developers feel differently about this. Some people think that code is self-documenting and they, they think every time you add comments in there it's harder to read the code and so you want to get a, you want to just get out of there and let the the user see what the code is for itself and if they understand that understand the language then the code should be explicit um, and if the code isn't explicit they need to rewrite it in a way that is um, and that I, I mean that mentality probably works for advanced users but if you have beginning users or people who aren't as familiar with the language are going to need more notes. And code comments can can help a user kind of navigate around a file, but they really are limited in the amount of explanation you can give. Um, so, how do you provide instructions for more lengthy samples, right? Let's say you, you really have some kind of uh, longer sample. You don't, want to, you don't want to bungle it up with too many comments in there. Um, how do you approach it? Well, there's a couple of techniques. Uh, you can build it up as a story, and the guy on the right here is a storyteller. Um, <clears throat> you can build it up as a story where, let's say, you, you faced with the initial problem and you say, oh, first we need to do X. In order to do that, we're going to use this little piece of code. Now we need to know this, and in order to get that information, we need to call this method. We're going to add that here and so forth. And you build it line by line. You kind of walk a person through how they go about um, getting all the information they need. And, and you write it almost like a narrative story. And then at the end, maybe you have the full code sample that you've explained piece by piece, and you say, okay, this is how, this is the full, the full thing. Or <clears throat> another technique would be give the person the full code sample up front, uh, just basically throw it in their face, and then afterwards describe it section by section. You take out the first five lines, explain what's going on, then at the next natural break, uh, explain that part and if you have uh, line numbers you can even refer to those line numbers or you can just repeat the, the code snippets. Um, I tend to do the latter a lot more uh, basically just throwing up the code sample and then exp explaining it after the fact because I think it I think that method kind of helps uh, address both advanced and beginning users. For the advanced users they see the code up front and if they can understand it, and maybe you even have little code comments in the in the long piece of code, but if they can understand it, they don't need to keep reading. They can just go somewhere else. But for people who are new and they look at the big code and they're confused or they need explanation, 
they can keep reading the detail and get more and more um, information about how that whole code sample is put together. So anyway, trying to address both novice users and advanced users and intermediate users with code samples can be a challenge, but I think um, really if you if you provide the explanation below the code sample, the advanced users can skip and skim. One problem is with non-linear code, and this is the case a lot of times. Um, as you're trying to explain code, I mentioned that if you take each section and kind of explain it chunk by chunk, that's one way to, to tackle it, but a lot of times code isn't really explainable chunk by chunk. You have different pieces in different places and not necessarily a, a linear sequence of things. Um, in that case, uh, you just explain the logic of how it's put together and <clears throat> and you may, this is where line numbers could be helpful, but at any rate you, you explain the different places where the different pieces appear. But just realize that, that not everything is linear and especially with um, you know object-oriented languages they're, they're not necessarily linear and so trying to go section by section through it isn't always going to work. Alright, I've got about six more questions here. Shouldn't I show our products full capabilities? Um, this is a question I've had a lot with uh, our JavaScript SDK. We want to show how cool it is, all the different things you can do with it, uh, the ways you can visualize and you can you can show levels and progress bars and all this. But as you as you try to show off what your product can do, uh, the code gets more and more complicated. And when you get really complicated code and it's you know not no longer ten lines but like hundred to two hundred lines of code or something. Uh, you're, you're kind of, you've moved out of the realm of code samples and you're more in the realm of a, a demo app or some kind of a reference implementation or something. Um, and definitely there's a need for this where you can show full working code samples. But that kind of code usually isn't uh, the, the core of documentation when you're trying to explain somebody how to use your, your API or SDK. Uh, you, usually in your, your core documentation you have short simple, plain as possible examples. Um, and then maybe in another section of your documentation you can you can add really lengthy code. Uh, and people uh, at that point, you know, trying to walk through it line by line may just be too much. And, and there you just show it to people and if they are at that level where they could actually implement it, then they're going to understand it. And if not, um, you know, maybe it's they're not ready for that. All right, where do you put code samples? This is a great question. Uh, I think you have a couple of, uh, three options at least. Um, you can separate it from the reference material, uh, and this keeps the reference material clean and minimal, but maybe not as integrated. So if you, let's say you have a, a certain method in your API, uh, remember that, that jQuery each method I showed at the beginning, do you show code examples that explain how to leverage that method or do you uh, uh, put those code samples in another place? You know, If you keep them together it kind of makes sense from an organizational point of view where you have things of a similar kind grouped together uh, but you could also um, you could also separate them because maybe you have a lot of different examples using this each method and putting too many would, would bury the the core information about the each method and what its um, what its arguments are, uh, what it is, what its method signature is, and so forth. So you can either separate them, keep them together. But I think what most people do is they'll provide a brief example in the reference material, and then maybe point to more lengthy, uh, robust examples in another part of the documentation. This is what I've done in uh, Badgeville's documentation, and. By the way, I would show more screenshots, but it's all behind a firewall. Um, at any rate, what we have is, uh, it, with each of the method, we have a, a simple code example that just shows the method in action. And then we have a whole separate section called code samples that lists a lot of different code samples. And they're, they're almost grouped in a different way. Rather than grouping by method, they're grouped by, by topic uh, and by scenario. 
some scenarios would leverage several different methods or several different functions, different ways of uh, different techniques, different calls, and so forth. And so, so in, in that scenario where you have multiple parts of your API being used, it wouldn't make sense to group all the code samples with each like method or, or each part of your API, but rather put them in a separate section. All right, uh, can I adopt a playful, irreverent tone with developer documentation? Y you'll notice that if you read a lot of uh, developer stuff that a lot of times, especially in code comments, there's a snarky tone where, uh, where a developer uh, just seems to have license to be irreverent and, and, and let their hair down and say whatever they want. Uh, in Learning JavaScript by Tim Wright, he says, code can always be a little more stressful than we would like, so don't be afraid to inject some humor into your comments. As far as brightening up someone's day when their eyeballs deep in code, it doesn't get much better than reading a funny comment someone left. I've even caught myself laughing at comments I've written in the past. It's always a nice surprise and lightens the mood. So if you are uh, if you are inclined to adopt a playful, irreverent tone, uh, you would probably be welcome in this arena. Now this assumes that you're not translating your material, and it assumes that like this sort of tone fits in with your company's brand. But in some situations, it can really be appropriate. And I think in most situations, um, I wouldn't recommend it simply because. Um, you, in order to, to make some kind of witty remark like this in a code comment, you really need to understand uh, everything that's going on, and you almost need to be a developer to have that sort of awareness and, and insight. But uh, anyway, just thought I'd mention this because it seems like a lot of the tone in developer docs is this way. All right, a few more questions. What's the best way to review code with engineers? Uh, and this is this is a tricky question because... Um, a lot of times with documentation, people can you, you can easily uh, comment on them. Um, with code, it's a lot harder because in some of these code sharing sites like Gist or Pastebin, uh, they don't lend themselves to any kind of margin comments very well. <clears throat> so what I do at Batchville is simply paste the code sample into Google Docs and the developer is able to highlight parts of the code and comment in the margins. And I found that the developers really like that. Even though you don't get any kind of syntax highlighting with Google, Google Docs, it's still uh, much more convenient. Of course, everybody um, at my company is on Google Docs as the business platform, so they all have access and everybody kind of uses it. It's a natural extension to use it to review code. But... Uh, but yeah, this is definitely a challenge. Now, um, hold on. Yeah, okay. Uh, you definitely want to review your code. Sometimes, as you as you as you write code, uh, maybe you get it to run and it works, and you think this is awesome. I can just go with it because clearly it's working. So why do I even need to review it? Uh, there's a lot of time, a, lo a lot of considerations that that are easy to overlook. Um, even if something works, it doesn't mean it's a best practice. Maybe it works, but it consumes a lot of memory, or it doesn't perform very well. It's not going to scale. Maybe in maybe your code involves like a ton of unnecessary calls in order to get the information, or maybe it's just inefficient. There there are more lines than you need, and there's a better way to kind of get the same amount. Uh, of work done in half the sp half the number of lines. There's almost a, a an ideal in in developer world in the developer's mind that the less code the better. Um, and there's just a number of other best practices that are sometimes um, hard to know. So so if you're if you're writing the code samples yourself, you always want to run them by an engineer for for review for a, a lot of reasons. 19, how can I make my code samples readable? So this is a syntax highlighter. This is from Google's Prettify, P-R-E-T-T-I-F-Y highlighter. And what it's going to do, <laughs> there are a lot of these kind of uh, syntax highlighters. Another one is Highlight.js, and, and if you just search for syntax highlighter, you'll find them. 
they try to uh, put different parts of the code in, in color. Um, I'm not entirely sure if I understand the rhyme and reason of, of all the syntax highlighting here. Sometimes it, it just almost looks like a different color for fun, but <laughs> anyway, the syntax highlighter is taking different parts of the code and, and trying to make it more readable. And when you publish your code online, uh, you definitely want to use a syntax highlighter. And, and different platforms have different uh, ways to do it. We publish our content on Drupal, and there's a, a Prettify module that you add. Um, even if you, let's say you just publish on straight HTML, you could use a tool like stackedit.io, and uh, when you convert to HTML using that site, you can choose to apply a syntax highlighting to any kind of code samples, and it will insert a ton of little span tags and so forth in the output. Um, anyway, you want to use that. Now, also, when you're, when you're writing code, there's a lot to keep in mind about the syntax. For example, if you look there at number five, line five, um, there's a the curly brace at the end of that line. Uh, the the closing curly brace is a couple lines down, and that closing curly brace lines up with the word for. And if you look at the next curly brace down, which is the closing curly brace for the the functions curly brace, that lines up with the word function. In order to make code readable, you really want to line up your curly braces um, above anything else. Uh, you want to make sure those line up because otherwise it's hard to tell what what uh, is closed and what isn't. And when you have some kind of error in your code, um, you know you want to make sure that you've got everything there. Another thing to note is is spacing. If you look down at line 11, for example, he noticed there's a space after the curly braces inside of them. That space is optional. And there's a space after the colon. There's another optional space. Uh, but it makes code more readable. There's actually a lot of suggested rules for how to format code. If you look at Douglas Crawford's book, um, he has great rules for how to, how to make JavaScript code more readable. There's a lot of different things like this um, that, that can help. So even if you get code from engineers, one thing you can do is format it in a way that that is going to make it more readable. You know, how how when do you break the lines? Um, how long should the lines be? And so all, all these kind of things are are considerations as you're trying to format and publish code. And there's a lot of different styles of syntax highlighting. You'll notice in the the next sample down in desert, there it's black, right, with uh, with with color on top. Um, and so you can choose different themes and try to figure out what makes it more readable. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's any best practice for which theme works best, but at any rate, use a syntax highlighter. And finally, last question, how do, how do I avoid tedious updates with new releases? So let's say you, you've spent a long time working code, you've got some great examples, some robust ones that show different scenarios, and then the programmers decide to change the API and they release a new endpoint or they deprecate a different endpoint and now all these code samples you've written are suddenly out of date. Um, this is kind of one of the saddest things, especially if they were really hard to to create these code samples. If it was really hard to make the code samples and now you have to throw them away or you have to go back and revise them. So code samples can be expensive and that's why you should keep them simple. Um, <laughs> If, if you invest time in a more robust code sample, know that at some point you may have to chuck that. Um, and so you want to make sure that any kind of more robust code samples are, are created for features that are more solidified, that aren't going to change. Um, because, yeah, every time you have to make those updates, it's a lot harder than just making a, a new screenshot of a changed interface. You have to go through, you're going you're gonna to have to rewrite the code, review the code, republish the code, so it's a lot more work. Okay, so those were 20 questions about code samples. I know that uh, a lot of the questions were all over the place there, but I, I hope I, I hit on a lot of the, the, the main points about writing code samples for, for technical writers and um, piqued your interest in this topic. Now, I'm at the end, and if you have questions or other issues that we can discuss, this is the time to do so. So, uh, thanks, Tom. We've had a few, quite a few questions about uh, 
uh, well, mostly comments about slides not showing, so I deleted all of them. I hope nobody feels offended that I deleted their questions. Um, I just left some uh, actual questions on the list, and actually I have only one from Lois Patterson. Uh, do you publish in Google Docs to the public, or how do you publish to the to the public? Yeah, I don't use we don't use Google Docs to publish. Um, Google Docs is a great format for uh, sharing and brainstorming and drafting code and documentation, but but yeah, I don't, I don't actually use it to publish. We use a solution that I really don't recommend. It's um, Drupal, which is a, a web platform, kind of like WordPress or Joomla. Uh, it allows a lot of uh, customization possibility, and, and, it, and it does show code pretty well because you can implement modules like the the Prettify highlighter and things like that. Problem is, you don't have hardly any opportunities for a reuse or pushing things out to print or creating different sort of uh, different arrangements. Uh, it's really kind of a fixed way to publish, and and I don't quite like it. it. Let's say you're let's say you're using Dita. How would you do syntax highlighting there? Um, I'm not actually sure to be honest. I think there's now that I think about it, uh, I know that if you search Oxygen's help, there's some syntax highlighting plugins that you can add to Dita that will allow the online part, at least. Uh, if not the print, I'm not sure, uh, to have the syntax highlighting. But yeah, whatever you, whatever way you publish, I think, um, the, you know, make sure you can highlight the syntax. But um, there's some other possibilities, too, that I've seen. Uh, one called Nan Nanok, N-A-N-O-K, or N-A-N-O-C. It's kind of interesting. It uses Markdown and then renders uh, a table of contents that allows people to easily kind of navigate through. And there's a lot of devel developer tools that are, will use Markdown. It's just kind of like a almost like a wiki syntax. Um, but yeah, I is there any any other questions about that, Louis, that I could try to tackle? I'm not really sure if I went in the right way that you were asking. Before Lois has a chance to respond, we also have some other questions coming in. Go for it. Um, for REST API examples, do you prefer to use curl or basic HTTP message format? By basic oh. HTTP message format, I mean listing the request line, header lines, and the message body, JSON or XML. Uh, we use curl a lot. I think that's pretty common. Um, and you know, especially if people have Macs, it's so easy to to put a curl command in a in the terminal window uh, and see the response. Um, but yeah, curl commands are pretty common in REST API documentation, and I think that's that's a standard. One of the things we do do that I think is helpful is show the response. Now the response can be pretty long, um, and if you can implement some expand and collapse functionality so that you can expand the response and see all the all the um, fields and the values that are returned in a sample response that's great and if you can do that in a live way let's say with live code um, even better um, there's a speaking of of doing sample commands and re, or sample curl commands and API calls and requests uh, check out a tool called Paw, I think that's the name. Um, if not, I'll put it in the show notes or, or other kind of notes. But it's a great little app, especially if you're on a Mac, for making different API requests because you can save a bunch of them and then just call them repeatedly so you don't have to uh, store them in some text file or something. You can have a whole list of different API calls that you can make uh, and see all the responses there formatted in a nice JSON readable format. Yeah, you know, I think there. I think in general, there needs to be better information about documenting REST APIs. Um, one topic that uh, came up: we had an API workshop a while ago, and a lot of people um, were asking about REST APIs specifically, because with other sort of APIs, you can use tools like Javadocs, Doxygen, and generate a lot of your documentation from the source code. But REST APIs really don't offer this, so you, the the approaches are a lot more creative in terms of how they how they do it, and that's a, a subject for another discussion. What other questions come in? 
Uh, in the meantime, uh, Lois responded that your answer was satisfactory, so thank you for that, Tom. Uh, last question was from Amy K. Thank you, Amy, for the question. Next one is, uh, do you have any suggestions about adding code samples to class libraries generated from Sandcastle or Java Docs? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think if you're generating your documentation uh, using those tools, uh, I don't think code samples are going to fit very well in there. You, you'll probably be able to do simple ones, but really, um, in those situations, I think you have to have a separate, separate uh, space where you where you do the code samples, and it's not going to be generated from any kind of code. Uh, and that's where you have your reference documentation separate from your your code samples. Um, you you might be able to link to them, uh, but but yeah, trying to integrate those two, I don't think is going to work. But uh, I, I could be wrong. <laughs> I I haven't worked with um, with Javadocs or Doxygen, so I'm not entirely sure, but that's my impression. Any other questions? Okay, uh, that was the question was from Mary Linderman. Thank you for for the question, Mary. Uh, next one from Amy K again. When you have multiple language SDKs, do you prefer to do the documentation individually for each language or to write one generic document with examples in each language? Maybe with a button you can click to see the example in a different language. You know, I, I've seen um, different approaches. If you check out RethinkDB, uh, as in like Rethink Database, RethinkDB.com, if you look at some of their API documentation, they have a great example of switching between like Python and, and Java and and some other language, maybe Ruby, I can't remember. Uh, but yeah, the, you're able to kind of show and hide what you want. And the way they've done it is slick. Um, I think anytime you can allow users to easily navigate from language to language like that, great. And if, and if you are providing code samples in, in a variety of languages, they're probably really short and sweet code snippets. Um, so yeah, probably probably do what makes sense. If you have really elaborate code that's longer, maybe it merits being put in a separate location. You know, and if you can if you can create different facets that people can toggle in order to see the language they want, all the more power to you. Um, I I really think this space in general is one that needs more depth in the tech com discussions. There's really, if you look at how API documentation is published, there's really not a standard way of doing it that I've seen. It seems like there's more variety. It's more of a Wild West frontier kind of landscape than any other sort of documentation. Um, and so I think uh, uh, trying different, different ways of doing it is is the best approach. Uh, so many companies have these custom built solutions. They have their own CMS and they have their own publishing platform. Um, other people who try to use like a help authoring tool are probably going to fall short. They're going to have uh, difficulties. Some people use Dita and they that works great for them. Uh, there really doesn't seem to be, in my experience, a standard way uh, of publishing stuff that's not auto generated from source code. So. Yeah, if you're able to, to switch between languages using um, buttons on your site, great. Um, that, go for it. Okay, we got one last question, and I think it's an interesting one. How do you feel about pseudocode? Uh, have you ever used it, or do you not recommend it, recommend it at all? No, I think pseudocode... So pseudocode is just... Uh, code that isn't actually it doesn't actually work but it sh steps you through the logic of how something is put together and I think that's great I mean when when developers often write code I think many of them begin with pseudocode as they try to walk through how they're going to build something um, and I've seen this a lot in the in the uh, head first or head start books from um, uh, whatever that series is, it's called Head Start. They, they a lot of times kind of walk you through the pseudocode first, so you get a logical grounding on how how to do something, and then you get into the technical details. So yeah, I think that's a great approach, because um, because really, you know, when you when you're explaining how your API or SDK works, you, you you're really trying to communicate to the user how to use it, right? And the technical details may be secondary to the conceptual details. And so yeah, pseudocode. 
is a good option. Um, I can't say that I have too many examples of it now that I think of it um, in my own documentation, but be something to explore, especially for, for more complex um, examples. Let's say you have a 75 uh, chunk of 75 lines of code, you know, you could, uh, pseudo camp, pseudo code that prefaces it might be really helpful there. You know, so Paula, there, is that was that was that the last question? That was the last question. One more thing flew in a uh, comment from Lois Patterson. She says that in her experience, data is hard to use in an environment where you have dozens of technical contributors. This is an interesting topic uh, that we could tackle in a separate webinar, I guess, because. You know, this is a this is a huge um, issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think a lot of times in in environments where you're writing developer documentation, you have a lot of developers involved, and when you do have a lot of developers involved, uh, yeah, trying to structure everything in Dita might not be the best way to go. It, it sort of depends a on how much collaboration you have, and um, yeah, the did it did it itself, you know, has a lot of topic types that may not necessarily speak to what you're trying to do. Um, if you're giving a code tutorial, uh, maybe you don't necessarily have like a standard list of steps. Maybe you have little uh, tips and a chunk of code and more explanations. So it's more of a concept type, and I don't know. It, it may not be the best fit, uh, Dita for for API doc. But I, I do know a lot of people who do use it, so. You know, in general, I just want to give some closing remarks. I think that this topic, uh, API documentation, developer documentation, is one that needs a lot more information in the tech comm world, and we're at a great time to really start pushing out more information. I hope to do more podcasts, blog posts. I know we have an intercom article that's going to touch on a lot of different topics. Um, it's really a great time to, to dive into this space. This is, this is um, definitely a, a direction to go to ensure career stability and opportunity and it's it's fun it's challenging it's a it's a new landscape and there's all kinds of um, things to learn and ways to grow your skills thanks for listening uh, my website if you if you don't know is I'd rather be writing dot com again my name is Tom Johnson you're, you're welcome to email me with questions you can just email me at Tom at I'd rather be writing dot com uh, thank you Tom uh, like Tom said if you still have questions just um, uh, use one of the methods he, he suggested. Also, don't forget to check out soapconf.com. Uh, you can sign up for the newsletter to be informed about our upcoming webinars, also about the conference, which is coming in October in Krakow, Poland. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Have a great rest of the day.